Amen. Well, if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, I almost said the gospel of Genesis, but it is good news. So that's okay if I say that. Last time we looked at the importance of submitting to Scripture as our highest authority, that no matter what the world might say, we must affirm that God made all things, that God is the one who is responsible for everything that exists, and that we must affirm not only this because Scripture says so, but because reason demands it as we see it in the creation itself. As Roman once says, everybody knows that this has to be true, that there is a God, that he is divine, that he has all power, that he will judge, that there's right and wrong. Everybody knows this, and God is the only possible explanation and the necessary explanation for it. And so we saw how important it is to acknowledge that. Well, this morning, we're going to get into some of the verses of the text And I've been emphasizing the the importance of acknowledging the truth of Scripture, that God is sovereign, that God made all things, that God alone is eternal, that everything else is a creature, that creature-creator distinction, the two-ism, if I can say it that way, of Christianity, the binary of Christianity, that there is one who's divine and that there are those who are not divine but creatures. And that's the essence of Christianity. There is a diversity in existence, God and creatures. Binary, two-ism. It's paganism that wants to make all one, all the same. Make all that is God. Deify man which does nothing but blaspheme God. And we've looked at that and we've emphasized that. This morning we're going to get into the verses and we're going to talk about what is happening in creation. And I want to acknowledge from the get-go that Christians, real believers, have different opinions on how to understand God having created all things. You see, that's what I've emphasized, and that's what we must all affirm. God is the creator. God is sovereign. God is divine. Man is his creature. Man can only be what he is according to the word of God. Things like a real fall, a real Adam, we're going to get there eventually, but that's what I've been emphasizing. But now I'm going to get to a place where we're going to talk about, and I'm going to certainly present to you What I believe is the correct interpretation of Scripture. By the way, that's what I always do. I only ever say what I think is the true interpretation of Scripture. But I recognize that there are other Christians who think differently. And I don't doubt that there are probably many in this room who will have a different take on these verses, all right? And I'm not here to condemn you. I hope that you come to what I think is the right view, as I hope that you would hope the same for me if you think your view is right. That's what we do as believers. We want to come into conformity with what God's word really says. And that's crucial that we all recognize the importance of that. If I was persuaded that my errors were errors, I would turn from them. And I would believe the same about you. And I know that there are Christians who would look at these verses and they would take a different take. Again, there is the day-age view. There is the framework or analogical day view. There are other views. I take what's called the literal or creationist view. You need to know that throughout her church history, that has been the majority report. If you look at the 2,000 years of the church, the majority of Christians, the majority of teachers have believed in six literal human days and a creation of recent times, six to 10,000 years. That's been the overwhelming view for 2,000 years. I think we all need to acknowledge that, all right? Also, that was the review of the Reformers, the time of the Reformation. In fact, of the Westminster Assembly, and it says this in the PCA position paper, which always tries to play all sides, but even the PCA position paper had the honesty to say, of all the divines, we don't know of a divine who wasn't six literal young earth. There might have been some, Not all of them wrote explicitly what they were, but everyone who did was six literal days, young earth. And the the paper honestly admits that. All right, John Calvin, as I'm going to show you, was clearly six literal days, young earth. That's been disputed, but he says it in his commentary. Clearly was. So we need to know that. You need to know that the majority position throughout the, from the Reformation till now has been the position that I'm going to present to you. But you also need to know 
the, from about the end of the 19th century to maybe even now, but certainly through the mid to late 20th century, the position that I'm going to present to you is by far a minority position, especially in the reform camp. In fact, if you looked at the mid 20th century, our heroes in the faith, and they are heroes, and I don't doubt that they are way more godly than me, and when I get to heaven, if I can see them at all, they're going to be way closer to the Lord than me, okay? But they did not take the view that I'm presenting. I'm talking about men like John Murray, Cornelius Van Til, Jonathan, or John Gerstner, and Machen and Stonehouse and going back to Hodge and Warfield, none of them took a six literal young earth view. Now, today, in our time, there has been sort of a resurgence and a revival, and there are many reformed ministers and theologians who are, have returned to that position. But at one time, you couldn't find one, all right? R.C. Sproul sort of represents that. In his whole life, he was not six little day. By the end of his life, he changed. And he says that in his commentary at Westminster, that he came to, probably the last 10 years or so of his life, back to a six literal day young earth view. And I think that that's kind of what we've seen in the reform camp, this completely abandoning the view and now somewhat a return. But I, like I said, I don't know if it would be majority or not. But at the end of the day, we have to be able to say, I believe this is what the Bible says. All right, and that's what I want to try to persuade you and I hope you're persuaded by. Not what I say, not what your favorite teacher says, certainly not what unbelieving scientists say, though I, I recognize that we have to take that into account at some level. I'm not somebody who's gonna set the Bible over against science. I do think that when the scientists clearly proved that the sun was the center of the solar system, that the theologians should have been more quick to respond, all right? That was a mistake. But I don't think that the scientists have proven anything with regard to things like evolution and billions of years and certainly not the creation just happening and exploding from nothing, which is absolutely absurd. And that's the view that's being put forward. So clearly there's a difference between things that are proven and demonstrated and can be shown in experiments and things that are called theories but are really at best hypotheses because we've never seen them happen. We're talking about the origin of all things. All right, so at the end of the day, what I hope we can all do and what you need to do, and you need to recognize this, and I think this might be helpful. I thought of this analogy this morning. Can you stand before God and say to him, God, my view is what I believe you mean here. My view, whether it's framework, analogical day, day age, literal, that you would feel comfortable doing that. God, I think that this is what you mean, and I think that everybody should see that, and if they don't see that, then they're wrong and they've made a mistake. Could you really picture yourself before God saying, I, this is what I think you mean, my view? Because that's the view you should have. The view that you think God means. And I hope there's nobody here who would take the opinion, well, God can mean anything I want to mean as long as it makes me feel good. Let's never do that with Scripture. God had a meaning, all right? You, maybe you take the position, God, chapter 1 of Genesis is so complicated and so difficult with such huge theological terms that I don't know how anybody could understand what you mean, so I don't know. I believe it, but I don't know. If honestly that's your position, fine, but that's a pretty difficult case to prove because this is a very simple chapter when it comes to words. Not a lot of different words used and not a lot of big ones. Pretty easy. So at the end of the day, that's what we need to be shooting for. We're going to have to answer to that. We all believe this is God's word. What is it actually saying? What is God's intention when he gave it? That's what I hope to try to persuade you of this morning, but let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father in heaven, we do pray for your word to come home to us as you intended it, as you meant it. Please do not let me say anything that I have conjured up on my own that appeals to my biases and my persuasions, which I know I have, but help me to be objective by your spirit and to speak to what your word actually says and what you really meant in it that we would understand it that way, that I would preach it that way. Lord, help us, I pray. And anything that I do say is wrong, help me to quickly repent of. 
and to believe and rightly teach your word. And so, Father, give us your spirit this morning. Give us humble hearts, recognizing that not all Christians agree on these things, but help us to love one another even when we disagree. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. By the way, I put 19 verses down. It's never going to happen. I've gone, through the, I've gone through the text a couple of times, and I can't do it in under an hour, so we're not going to get through all the text today. I don't want to keep you all day. I have a wife that wouldn't like it if I kept you all day as well, and I have to answer to her right after the service. So we're going to try to stay within the normal bounds of about 30 minutes at this point. So hear now the word of the Lord. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. May the Lord establish this word in our hearts this morning, I pray. You may have noticed I read it a little bit different than it's printed in your bulletin because every verse in Hebrew, and there are no manuscript issues, begins with the word and. Every verse. There is no thens, there is no thus, there is no sos. So I know the New King James and some English translations do that because in English we kind of vary things. You don't want to keep saying and, 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 and. But they keep saying and in the Hebrew. And that's all they say. They never say so, they never say then, they never say thus. So I read it and. And is just a vav, a little one letter, and you stick it on the front of a word. It's always connected to a word. And in narrative texts, one of the markings of a narrative text is what's called the vav consecutive, which means the verb is in the imperfect, but you read it as a perfect because of the vav and the form that's there. And every one of the ands at the beginning of every one of the verses is a vav consecutive throughout Genesis 1. It's one of the reasons why creationists argue that this is narrative because that's a hallmark of narrative text. But I want you to notice this morning, and you can see how um, optimistic I was with this outline. I did have four points, and the name of my first point is the first day. <laughs> We're not going to get there. We're not going to get the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. I'd love to get through two days today, but I don't know if we will. We already saw in verse 1 that God is there already in the beginning. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God alone is eternal. God alone is independent. God alone is necessary. Being self-existent, being everything else is brought 
into being from nothing, an infinite bridge to gap, requiring an infinite power, and God does it with a word. He speaks, and what did not exist, God calls the things as not, as though they were, to use the New Testament attribution of God bringing things from nothing into existence. God alone is eternal, infinite, unchangeable, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and all the rest. And we saw that. But I want you to notice that in this first verse, we see God creating something. It's called the heavens and the earth. Now, in Hebrew parlance, that's everything. The heavens is above you. The earth is what you're standing on. There's nothing else. Okay, and of course, the heavens would be everything around you, yes, under the planet, ultimately. The heavens and the earth would be all of space and all of the ground that we stand on. But what I see God creating in this text as we look at it, there is a something, there is something here. There is now something in addition to God. I think we're seeing at this point God bringing into existence space. There was no space before. We, we, space is a creature. Time. There was no time before. By the way, Big Bang cosmologists believe space and time started with the Big Bang. So if you got a problem with me saying God created time, then you must not believe in Big Bang cosmology either because they believe it all began. Time. There's no before the Big Bang. They'll say it. Time began with the Big Bang. Space began with the Big Bang. We say time and space began with God creating something because time is a measurement of change and God didn't change in eternity. There's many other ways to get there, but I don't want to waste any more time on that. Time, space, matter, energy. God now has the raw materials. That's verse 1. There was nothing. Now God's brought into existence the raw materials. You know, think of going to 84 lumber. And you got all the raw materials there, right? You know, you got your boards and your nails and your fasteners and your tools. And you can build a whole house. At least you used to be able to go into 84 lumber. Most of them are out of business now because of Home Depot and Lowe's. But, um... You could buy all this stuff, but it was just materials. It was just there. There's a sense in which this isn't even that organized because I don't think there's really a recognizable creature at this point. There is stuff, right? It's interesting. If you read any of Big Bang cosmology, they'll talk about in the, at the quantum level. Quantum just means really, really, really small. At the quantum level, the, the, the laws of physics don't work. Right, in, the, in what they call the inflationary stage, which is like super, super fast, like 10 to the negative 43. I mean, just ridiculous. Like the tiny little bit, but they'll say that, they're, that physics don't work. They need to say that because if physics worked, the Big Bang wouldn't work. So they say, well, maybe physics don't work. So this is the way they reason. Maybe physics don't work then. And so at the super small level, you have just... Nothing really established yet. The explosion and then laws of physics at some point kick in. Well, what I'm saying here is at the beginning, God creates this stuff, right? He creates, I don't even necessarily want to call it matter, but matter, energy, at least the building blocks for it. He creates time, space. And we get a picture of it here in verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Now, that's a Hebrew figure, Without form and void, tohu wabohu. You've probably heard that, maybe, if you've read any of this stuff. It's a very famous phrase, tohu wabohu. Without form and void. There's another figure in the text. The Bible has all sorts of literary devices where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, ha'aretz. Vaharetz, it starts verse 2. So you get the ha'aretz, the last word, and then ha'aretz is the first word, which is a way of saying the text is going to focus on the earth. Eretz is the earth. Eretz. And so by, by ending the first verse with the word earth and by beginning the second verse, da is part of the word in both in Hebrew. So da is just the letter hey, H. So you get earth at the end of verse 1, earth at the very first word of verse 2. It just, it's striking to read it that way. And that tells you that God is telling you to focus on the earth that the rest of the text about creation is going to be focused on the earth from the earth's perspective because it ended the first verse with that, with that word and it begins the second with that word. And I can't remember the name, Anna Diplosis or something, but there's a name for that kind of figure. 
And it's used all over the place in Scripture, but that's a way of telling us the earth is what's important from here on out. And it's true. I mean, we get a little bit about the heavens, and we're going to see that when we look at it in day three, but even that's from the perspective of the earth. Everything's focused on the earth, which is why God wants us to know. God doesn't tell us a lot about the Andromeda galaxy, right? We don't know a whole lot about that. He's not interested in us knowing that because he's interested in us knowing what we need to know to worship and glorify him and achieve our purpose, which is ultimately um, beatitude. And in being brought into his perfection and joy and delight and happiness. And we know that by knowing who we are and who he is and about the earth. So we have this, the earth was tohu wabohu, without form, void, a wasteland, a desert, unorganized, chaos. Some even say empty, but not completely empty. There's just no structure there. Tohu wabohu. That's what it is. God's made stuff. It's there. But it's just waiting to be given form. God makes his materials first. Remember, the creation is, is not only what God did in history, but it's also showing man how to be like God because we're made in his image. One of the things we're going to see is that we do the same kind of things that God is doing here. So God begins by creating the materials. By the way... If you've read any commentaries, you probably know that darkness was on the face of the deep is sometimes used by liberal scholars. And when I say liberal scholars, I don't mean believers who take different views. I mean liberal scholars who believe the Bible's a myth, who believe the Bible makes errors. Okay, that's liberal scholars, not believers. They might claim to be believers, but if you don't believe this word is the word of God, I don't know what you're believing in. But they would say the darkness and the deep, since God didn't make them, the text doesn't say he made them, that's Moses writing really what is a polemical myth against, you know, the gods and goddesses of Egypt or Babylon or whatever. The deep, Tiamat in Babylonian myth. To home, oh, it's kind of, kind of sounds a little bit in, in Hebrew, deep means to home. And darkness, why they're already there. The darkness is already there, the deep's already there. No, God made the darkness and God made the deep. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. I, the Lord, form the light and create, bara, create darkness. God created the darkness. It's included in verse 1, the heavens and the earth. No, it doesn't spell out that he made the darkness, but it says it in Isaiah 45, 7. I create darkness. Psalm, sorry, Proverbs 8:24. Jesus speaking as the pre-incarnate Christ, the wisdom of God who is eternal and with God and does everything God does. Proverbs 8, 24. When there were no deeps, tahomoth, plural in the feminine. When there were no deeps, I was there, wisdom says. So Jesus was before, was, was before the deep. Therefore, God made the deep from nothing too. So this is not some polemic in the line of the Anush. Uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, what is it, Alima Anush, the Babylonian myth that scholars would like to compare this to. I, I'm really tempted to read to you for some of the Babylonian myth. I brought it up into the pulpit. It's seven tablets long. It's 12 and a half times longer than Genesis 1. If you want to add Genesis 2 to the Enuma Elish, it is seven, more than seven times longer. If you want to add Genesis 3, it's four and a half times longer. It's a long running um, diatribe about all of these gods and goddesses who are there at the beginning and they're quarreling with one another and one doesn't like another's robes and another one gets mad because there's too much noise from the kid gods and you get to about the fourth generation or fifth generation of gods and you finally get Marduk who is the creator. Four or five generations of gods after he kills Tiamat and makes her carcass into the world. And that's supposed to compare with this. Madness. Read it. You can go online. The Enuma Elish. It's free. It's a waste of your time, but you can read it anyway. And how Marduk lays out the carcass of Tiamat into the heavens and into the earth. And then they make man to be a servant so that the gods can rest. And it's the blood drops of a God who has to be sacrificed for man to be created. And it's just myth. That's not what we get here, is it? 
One of the striking things about this text is how it does, at many places, intersect with what modern science is saying. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want to finish out verse 2 first. But so we have this darkness that's there that God created. The deep, by the way, the deep is almost always, and remember, we're on the earth. We're focusing on the earth because the figure told us that. And the earth was. Darkness was on the face of the deep in the earth, which would be what? The oceans. The deep is always that. When God brought his people through the sea, he, he brought them through the deep. The deep is the ocean chasms and the, the, you know, goes down further than Mount Everest goes up, way further. It's very deep. We know that. They probably didn't then, but the scripture got it right. Their deeps, very, very deep. And God here is pictured, verse 2, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. All right? The word hovering, a lot of stuff's been written on that. It's not doesn't show up too often. Some say brooding as a mother broods over a nest to bring the eggs to hatch. It doesn't work, unfortunately, because the only place that the words used that way is Deuteronomy 32, 11, and the eagles are already hatched. The mother is fluttering over them, trying to get them to fly. So it's, a, it's sort of an anticipation of activity, right? The spirit is there, poised to act. Because who carries out God's work? Who applies the works of God to the creation? The Spirit, right? The Spirit comes upon someone and the Spirit causes you to be born again. So the Spirit's there poised and ready to act as soon as God speaks. And then God said, verse 3, let there be light. The first recognizable thing in creation is the Word of God. There's a mass of chaotic stuff But the first thing that's recognizable, now whether or not there were any angels created yet, Scripture doesn't say. Some say the separation of darkness from light. There's no mention of when the angels are created. But whenever they are created, they would have been able to understand, obviously, God's rational speech. But God speaks that word, whether there was anyone there to hear it or not. It's not like the tree that falls. It was heard. It created something. That word created light. By the way, this isn't the entrance of Christ into the creation. He was there at the beginning. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Therefore, he was there in making things in verse 1, 2. The Father, Son, and Spirit are all credited with the work of creation, just as they're all credited with different ways the work of salvation. Because he is one God, one essence, and he, Jesus says, all the things you see the Father doing, I do in like manner. So Jesus was already there in verse 1, verse 2. Now God speaks. Some think this is Christ speaking. It just says God, Father, Son, and Spirit are God. God saw, uh, said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, the first actual, organized, recognizable creature in this universe is light. The first thing that you can identify by the laws of physics or whatever is this thing we call light. What is light? Light is electromagnetic energy, or more specifically, electromagnetic radiation. It's the very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is the visible portion of light. Very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum is visible. You go all the way to the shorter uh, waves and you get gamma ray uh, waves over here and X-rays. Very, very small section is visible. And then very long waves, radio waves, which can be several feet long, over here. Can't see any of those either. But we can see light, electromagnetic energy. Did you know that all creatures, all creatures, by the laws of physics, give off electromagnetic energy, give off, in a sense, light not visible? The number one light that man gives off is infrared. That's why, you know, you watch those spy shows and they can see the people with their infrared cameras. Because your bodies are giving off infrared light. If there was an animal that had infrared vision, he could see all of you in the dark. You give it off. All creatures give off light. I wonder if when God says, let there be light, if he isn't actually instituting the molecular structure of the universe, that there are such things now as atoms and electrons because that necessarily gives off electromagnetic energy because that's what electrons do as they move. Let there be light. There's molecular structure now in the universe. Electromagnetic energy. 
It wasn't there before. God's creating the rules. He's creating the laws. Where did they come from? They didn't come from nothing. God made them. One of the interesting things is when God says, let there be light, and there's light, and so there was this pile of stuff, and now there's light. When the Big Bang Theory first began to replace the eternal state universe theory of the mid-20th century, many theologians and Christians were rejoicing, okay? And they had a lot of things to rejoice about because the Big Bang Theory said a lot of things that sounded like what Scripture was saying. And I'm not here to criticize that. I love the fact that the Big Bang Theory says there had to be a beginning. There was nothing and then there was a beginning. I love that. I hate that they say nothing made everything. That's insane. They won't acknowledge God. They won't acknowledge there has to be a God. There has to be a being who is not a thing who made all things or else you can't get from nothing to everything. They just say nothing makes everything, a smeared out point of singularity, a point that's smeared out. It's a point. No, no, it's smeared out. Can't be both. That's what they say. That way you can't nail it down. Well, it's not really a point. It's smeared out. What is that? That became everything. That was nothing that you couldn't measure because it didn't exist. And it explodes. And there's everything. It sounds a lot like God saying, let there be light. And bang! Big bang. There was light. No wonder the theologians like this. They're finally saying what the Bible says. There was a beginning. Because they weren't saying that before. A steady state universe, the universe uh, replaces energy and matter at the same rate it loses it. Somewhere, somehow, something's been pushing energy in. It's not a closed system. First law of thermodynamics doesn't apply. No, they say now it has to. And it began. And there was a beginning. That's really great. In fact, Time Magazine, February 1979, said this, quote, the Big Bang Theory sounds very much like the story that the Old Testament has been telling all along, end quote. 1979, this was still like, it was just starting to really be accepted. Sounds like the, what the Old Testament's been saying all along, bang, there was light. And they say how fast things started to expand, super fast from that nothing point. From, I think it was 10 to the negative 43 second uh, a fraction of a second, it goes from nothing to the size of a grapefruit. That's the inflationary stage. And then it does it again. And, like, you know, everything's kicking in. And that's what they say, okay? I, I don't know. Maybe God, maybe God did start from a small point and have it all go out. I don't know that. To me, I don't really care about that. I just care that God did it, that he had to do it, that they should acknowledge that, that you can't get everything from nothing, which they don't acknowledge. And that's where I, as a non-scientist, must criticize them because you don't have to be a scientist to have a brain. And to know that you can't get something from nothing. That's not science anymore. That's insanity. So I do criticize them at that, and I throw that part out. But the idea that there was a creation, that inanimate matter came first, that matter and energy came first, that, that things started to expand out, and that things formed out of that, and a long time later came light, you know, I would say, or I'm sorry, life, I would say five days later, but... Still, four days, if you want to call it plant life, still it, it, it was a great step forward. In, in his 1978 bestseller, God and the Astronomers, world-renowned astrophysicist Robert Jastrow commenting on the irony of how the scientists' own method brought them to a starting point beyond which they could not go and to a place they never wanted to go anyway. But they're stuck there now. And this is what he said. This is a famous quote. You've probably heard this. Quote, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. That's the quote of this world-renowned astro astrophysicist on recognizing that there was a beginning from nothing. Well, that's what the Christians and the, the Jews have been saying all along. You can see why this would be a phenomenal thing. However, we need to recognize the text says nothing about exploding, forming matter and energy. It just says light. 
But whether or not God caused the universe to expand with that, that stuff he made in verse 1, there is a beginning and they're talking about it and there is now this light. And what does God do? God saw the light that it was good. I'm going to drop that for a second because I want to save that. And God divided the light from the darkness and the, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning the first day. So what does God do? He separates, he distinguishes, he orders, he names all the things that man's going to do. He's going to tell man to separate and distinguish and order and name and, and tend and work this garden and create wonderful things and bring this creation, which in a certain sense is a certain amount of um, raw material. You know, he, he, but he makes one garden and he puts man there and that would have shown man what? This is the kind of thing I want you to do with the world. Make it like my garden. Go out and cultivate this wild earth that I've given you, these resources. Be like me. I'm going to make you my vice regent. and you're going to rule over all of it and it's all good. That's the point of him seeing it, that it's good. Not that God needed to. Hmm, I wonder if it's good, you know. That's what I do when I make something. I stand back and say, oh man, I could see where I messed up there. No, no, no. God wasn't checking it out to know. That's there for us to know that he was so careful that even after he made it, as it were, again, an anthropomorphic type of thing, he, he inspects it, Right? Oh, no, it's good. I, I see every part of it. That's so that we would never doubt that every single thing God made is good. Not only did he make it with all of his power, all of his wisdom, all of his goodness, but after he made it, he checked it out. That no one would ever doubt or question that there'd be some wicked thing, some bad thing that God put here. It's not my fault, God. You did it. You put something bad here. No, there's nothing bad here. Nothing. He saw that it was good. We're going to get that refrain over and over again seven times. He saw that it was good. Not after every day, but it's going to be seven times. He saw that it was very good at the end. And we get here the first mention of a day. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. The first mention of time, right here. A day. Now the He's calling the light day. There's three ways the word day is used in Scripture, all right? The daytime, day. It's not the whole day, not 24 hours. In Pittsburgh, if you're not from Pittsburgh, it's going to get shorter, let me tell you. By the middle of December and the middle of January, we get maybe nine hours of daytime if you're lucky. It keeps getting shorter and shorter because, you know, the tilt of the earth axis and we're in the winter quarter of the orbit and all that stuff. And then we get longer days in the summer, right? But the day is the daytime. Well, we use that all the time, the day. We, we don't mean the whole 24 hour. We just mean, oh, it's day now. But then the word day is also used, as it's used here, to describe the whole day, right? The 24-hour day, what we call a rotation of the earth on its axis before the sun, where it gets back to where it started. One calendar, you know, marking of a day that you can tell by the sun and by the earth. That it's not an arbitrary thing like a week. Well, we're going to just say a week has seven days. There's nothing to correspond to that in creation. But you can't deny that a day is 24 hours. You can't deny that or you're going to, I don't know, you're going to have days that are fantasies because it, everything repeats itself after 24 hours. So we know that that's how long the day is. And that's the way it's used the second time. God called the light day, daytime, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day, 24-hour day. Evening and morning, the beginning of the daylight, the ending of the daylight. Backwards, <laughs> ending and beginning, evening and morning. And then we have a day, right? The 24-hour day. Now, clearly that's what it said. Now, whether or not we're supposed to understand that as billions of years or whether or not that's just a figure for us to recognize that what God does in his day, you know, whatever that means, we're supposed to do likewise in our much shorter day. Um, I'm not really interested in that question right now. I will recognize that there is a third use of the word day and that is a period of time of unspecified duration. You get that right away in chapter 2, verse 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day that the Lord created the heavens and the earth. In, in the day, in the time. At that age, in that time. You get it in Isaiah chapter 4, um, verse 2. In the day of the Messiah. All that time. In that day. So you know, how many times does scripture say that? In that day. In his day. Uh, day. His time period. Whatever. 
But what we have to recognize is what does it mean here? And can we clock that through? Let me just say this, and I'm going to wrap up here. We're just going to get through one day. But this word here, the first day, it actually should say one day. It's, it's, it's a cardinal number. It's not an ordi uh, ordinal number. Cardinal number is one, two, three, four, five. Ordinal numbers are first, second, third, fourth, fifth. There's one cardinal number in this text, and that's right here. So there were evening and there was morning. One day is what it should say. One day. It's cardinal. After that, every number is ordinal. Second day. It shouldn't say two days. It should say second day. Third day. Fourth day. It does that all the way through the seventh day. They're ordinal after this. There's no other place in Scripture that we know of that takes a figurative use of ordinal days. Cardinal days they do, but not ordinal days. We don't know of a second day that's actually like, you know, two million years or whatever, or an unspecified time period. Second days, every other place is always the second normal day. Third day, fourth day, and no other place that we know of that evening and morning, along with the ordinal use of an ordinal day, is used to be a figure. So that's something that, to get over. This could be the only place. Maybe that's the answer. This is the only place and we need to accept it as that. But what I want you to notice here as we're wrapping this up is that God made all things, that he made all things good, and that he made things that we would be able to serve him confidently, knowing that this is his world, that we are his. And therefore, I think it's so important, again, to the bigger emphasis here, whether or not we all agree on the time involved, but the bigger emphasis is that God made it all and he made us, and we have to respond to him according to his word. So let's pray as we close. Father, we do thank you for your word, and I do pray that as we look at it, you would change us by your spirit, Lord. Apart from your grace, we can't serve you because we've fallen. You did make all things good, but we've sinned, Father, and we know that, though we haven't seen that in today's scripture text. We know that we've sinned, and yet you've redeemed us by Jesus Christ. As we're about to celebrate his remembrance, our remembrance of him and what he did for us in the Lord's Supper. So bless us, Father, as we turn now to your ordinance of the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.